Okay, folks. CNCF distribution returns. Uh, I gotta, yeah. <laughs> I was about to wonder if we had the same person back from last week. Yeah, well, that's why everybody's got to sign in now, unfortunately. Mask Maradas. All right. So from an agenda point of view, Niaz has a hard stop at 9.30. So Niaz, did you actually get that on the agenda? I'm cheat. Yeah, I put in an item and I can uh, go okay. over like a quick recap. Uh, so uh, Marina and I had a call around key management uh, last week. Um, and uh, as a result of that, I've updated the pull request. Uh, the pull request now has all the comments that we had uh, discussed when we looked at the previous requirements as well. Uh, I've changed this into a key management requirements doc. Uh, and then we'll have uh, an additional doc for scenarios that way we can do iterative pull requests. There are three areas uh, that the requirements doc calls out that we will need three separate docs uh, to dive further into. Uh, one of them is around a uh, key or signature expiry. expiry. Um, this is one where like a timestamp authority also comes into potential play. Uh, we'll have a separate doc to kind of look at the pros and cons of different approaches. Uh, we'll have a doc around uh, root key rotation. Um, this is one that uh, I'm working on. And then we'll have another doc around uh, signature allow list deny list. Um, that's essentially looking at whether we go with the um, uh, trusted update model, which Tuff uh, provides, or a revocation list, uh, both have pros and cons. So we'll we'll dig into each one of those. So um, I also spelled out what their prototype uh, sequences should be. Um, the first prototype is something that we can already start working on while we work out some of the key rotation revocation details. Awesome. That's awesome. Um, I when just to maybe incorporate some of the prototypes, uh, I did that open SSF talk this last week, and I realized that the steps that I had documented to try to be high level of the goal wasn't actually as repeatable uh, if you try to do it yourself. Um, we for the demos that we were doing, we hosted it on an app service, which allowed us to have a public endpoint with a I guess there was an SSL cert on it. And it turns out there was some gaps in the NV2 CLI that couldn't actually work with a insecure registry. So um, we did two things. One, and I'll explain why I'm doing this detail here for a second. We did two things. One, we fixed it so you could actually have uh, support uh, untrusted registries and actually use a local instance of Docker or, or CNCF distribution, to be fair now. Um, with uh, a PR that uh, Avaral wrote to support the linked lists, linked items. Uh, so we made um, the changes to NV2 and I think it was, or I don't know if it was Ores or just NV2 or maybe it was generate Docker, the thing that Shiwe did. So now, and I also wrote the full steps that it takes to actually do this from beginning to end. Basically my demo, I wrote down my own demo steps and published it. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll put that in the notes here. So with, now that we actually have something that's provable that it works, it'd be great if we could incorporate the key, no, key management prototype that you're doing into that. And, and you know, like I, I usually do a test where I try, I do a push, and then I try to pull without the keys uh, configured, and the pull fails. And then you, you know, we put the key link in there, and then the pull succeeds. Um, it'd be great if you guys can do a similar thing that says like here, you know, the you know the key is, I don't think you would revoke the key first, but you know, here I could pull and now I'm gonna revoke the key or whatever, invalidate the key, whatever you wanna do. And now the, the pull would fail. So it'd be great just whether that's the exact demo you wanna do or not, but I'd love to see that key revocation kind of in that same end end prototype that we could demo to all this and, and flush out the gaps. Yeah, we can, I think, quickly uh, go through the prototype uh, uh, stages, if that makes sense. 
Okay, great. I'm just getting the link to that. Was that the extent of your update? Did you want to go through any of it? Yeah, that was the extent. Okay. And let me just put this demo script. I'll paste it in our chat. And I'll put it in the notes as well. Um, anything else, or do we have uh, Marina take the floor? Oh, that's all I had. I'm... Oh, just last one uh, on prototyping. I started hearing some people reaching out on doing some uh, demonstration demos, prototyping with OPA and Gatekeeper. So, uh, for anybody else that's interested, um, I'll see if I can get something just basic written up um, just to kind of be a stake in the ground. So right, here's the, at least a reference point of what we were thinking. And then hopefully whoever is gonna work on that will take it to the next level. Um, but at least they kind of know um, at least what we've been thinking so far. So they have something to work with uh, and there's some continuity. So with that, Marina, the floor is yours. All right. Um, yeah, I was just hoping to give an update on the um, tough prototype um, effort. And I think mostly I've been working on a specification for describing how um, tough could work in Node V2. Um, there's a pull request open. I linked it in the notes. Um, I guess I can just go through the document unless anyone has any questions already that we can go through. I can try and share that. Let me see. All right, can anyone, everyone see that? All right, cool. Um, yeah, this is just um, basically an overview of how, like what basically, what which pieces of tough metadata would need to be put into the registry. And then I figured this could work alongside like the, you know, the other prototype efforts and, and then fit into that OCA artifact format to then go on the registry itself. So that's kind of, where this fits in. And I kind of focus on describing the processes that we'll need to develop to make this happen and then the formats of those pieces of metadata. So um, I'll just go through each of these sections. The root metadata, metadata is, is pretty straightforward from like a design perspective. It just needs to be, you know, signed offline to keep the um, those keys to, as secure as possible and then uploaded. Um, Using this process, and this you know th th these commands are all, you know, examples for now. We can update as, as as the design um, evolves, to just to kind of give a give a sense for what the what it could look like. But the idea being, you know, you'd create it and then you'd upload this root metadata, and it would be in a format that could be uploaded to the registry, which I describe later. Um, and this is the workflow for a developer. Um, so yeah, they'd sign the image. Um, with an image name and then you know a location of a key, um, which doesn't have to be like a file. It could also be some sort of a you know you have a key or any other kind of um, key thing, and the name of the role that is signing it to make sure that they have permission. And the idea being that they would um, yeah I guess I'll go I have that in a minute. Um, yes, yeah, so and they they'd sign it, they'd upload it. And then they would also, as well as uploading the actual target's metadata, they would send it to a snapshot process, which I'll describe in a minute, but that the snapshot process basically is responsible for the snapshot and timestamp tough metadata. And it's, um, it's a separate process from the developer that kind of runs automatically to update those pieces of metadata and upload them to the registry, kind of keep that up to date. Um, I guess we can go over that now. So this is basically, this kind of goes over a lot of the, um, it kind of is a way to do snapshot that I think addresses a lot of the concerns that people in this group have had. So the idea is that you would have a service run either by the registry or basically any external server that can, you know, has a verifiable current time. <laughs> so 
pretty much any server, which can then run in. Um, so it receives the target's metadata, adds the snapshot and timestamp information, and keeps track of all the current versions that should be on the registry, so that you can have that snapshot that knows what all the current metadata is. Um, and then this delegations piece, which I think is one of the big pieces um, to kind of figure out, which kind of figures out how to delegate keys. So like, you know, each developer has a key. And one of the cool things that Tuff does is that um, from the root, if you just have the root key as a user, you can then use that root key to find the key that's trusted to sign a particular image or a particular thing that you want to download. So this is just kind of some information about how to configure that in the first place so that the user can then just automatically download this and get to the image that they'd like to install. So they can see how they delegate it. And then also if they could, they could remove it by revoking that delegation. And then they'd, after doing adding any number of delegations, they can upload that role that's doing the delegations. Um, and it'll be available to users who can then use these delegations to find any, um, any, any actual images that they want to download. And the, the download is pretty straightforward. Basically, this is just describing the things that the user would need to query in order to download an image. Um, and this kind of section is just to describe, um, you know, what that registry query would have to look like in order to um, download these pieces of information. So it would just be the root metadata, timestamp, snapshot, and then kind of the chain of targets to get to the metadata that signs the particular image that they're downloading. A quick note about deleting metadata, um, which is basically, you know, when it's old, it can be deleted, just kind of, but it doesn't have to be deleted right away. This is just kind of to allow um, over time, registries to not get like excessive amounts of, of tough metadata hanging around. So this is kind of, I think, the, the key part, really. This is what the, the metadata would look like. And um, I added this media type to try and make it fit in with the, the current version of the artifact spec, and hopefully this will all work as is. So all of the, the files you can have, have this general type. They're a, you know, a tough media type with the role name for with the role info for the particular role and then any attached signatures um, by key ID. And this can really, we can discuss that more, but basically this is just, you know, they all need to be included in the, the registry. Um, and so then we have the different types of metadata. So root is pretty straightforward. It just lists the keys for um, the other roles. And so this, this is basically just to say, you know, this is a root of trust. These are all the other top level roles. Um, snapshot, similarly pretty straightforward. Um, you know, it has a, a version number and most importantly, it lists the version number and optionally the length of every other metadata file um, that's gonna be in the registry of the tough metadata file that's associated with this root and this snapshot. Um, targets is where it gets a little bit more interesting. I think that this is, you know, where you can actually sign the images. So this would, the, these, um, the targets here include um, hashes of all the images that this targets file is um, attesting to. And then the delegations um, adds any, any delegations to other targets that could sign images from this role. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of fields here to deal with specific edge cases, but in the basic case, this just lists another place that can sign it. And then the timestamp role, um, is it probably, you know, the simplest of them all, just make sure that this is all timely and that the snapshot is, you know, the most recent snapshot within a, a certain time frame. Um, yeah, and then yeah, some example metadata with some real examples in here using various key types. So, is there any, any questions or any other things I should go into more depth, deep depth? I kind of did, if that was a very brief overview, I'm not sure where people have questions or would like to get involved or whatever. Yeah, Marina. So this looks like you know, it, this looks like a great amount of detail trying to align this with how you could push stuff into the registry, you know, with the artifact approach. So we don't have to add a whole bunch of extra APIs. And, and I'm still not sure how it how we deal with the immutability aspect of it. But I think the the thing I'm struggling the most with is like we're we're going into detail about how we can use Tough for this, with the assumption we would use Tough, but we haven't really explained what requirements are driving the need to use these things and that's oh yeah totally i think i have 
I have other documents, I think, that describe kind of more of that piece of it. It's kind of what Tuff does, which problems it solves. The idea here is just to show that it's possible with kind of the existing registry um, APIs, like you said, like this, you know, this is what the metadata would actually look like. I think as far as problems that it's solving, it really is solving those kind of um, some of the key management, I think the delegation and actually key discovery piece of Tuff is something that is, hasn't been addressed in any of the other parts of the no Dewey effort, as well as a lot of the compromise resilience pieces and not relying on any single key for any single purpose. Uh, I think something, Marina, that would be helpful here um, is for the key management requirements that we have agreed upon, mm -hmm. uh, calling out where Tuff is addressing them and how it's addressing them would help. I know that, like, for example, around key expiry, key rotation, and the signature allow list, deny list, we still have additional requirements to define, uh, but we have some requirements around where keys need to be stored uh, versus how the trust or configuration needs to work, right? So yeah. I think if you can call out uh, how this prototype addresses those, like that would be uh, that would be helpful. Yeah, for sure. Oh, so this one. Um, yeah, and maybe address some of those exact key management things, like um, how to manage these root keys and other things like that. Um, Cause yeah, I think that the biggest place that this this deals with that is the, through the use of of the delegations. Um, which does a lot of that key management piece for you and it includes the revocation and the, um, as well as the time stamping that's required for either um, revocation lists or lists of valid keys. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. I, I think the thing that I just um, keep on holding that balance on is so secure that it's too difficult to use and so easy to use that anybody can, you know, get around it. We have to find that balance and i'm just exactly i think that's why i'm trying to um prototype this out and kind of make a working demo of of these features to kind of show that that um the, the workflow and and make sure that that's a workflow that's easy enough to use so that it can be used in practice i think that's kind of the idea here i, I get it i guess i would start with because any com any amount of because obviously there's some complexity here any amount of complexity has to be justified so mm -hmm. we could start with, here's the problem we're trying to solve and make sure that we actually have buy-in that that is a problem we want to solve. Yeah, I, I, but I feel like we have a lot of documents that describe the problems we're trying to solve. And I, and I do think that this addresses a lot of those problems. I just, I, yeah. I, I, feel I like don't see having... them in our notary v2 requirements and that's maybe they're, they're queued up okay. and they haven't gotten merged yet. So that's the part that I would really focus on. And I feel is... like if we spend too long only ever talking about requirements, we'll never get anything actually written because we'll be too busy on that stage of it. If we can't agree like we need, on the requirements, we need, we need it doesn't matter what the design is. Like, but we need demos and we need actual solutions to the problems as well. I don't know. I feel like there's definitely a balance there to doing both of those things. And maybe I need to do more of the one, but I think there's also a value to having, um, you know, things we can show and show how the usability, the complexity is kind of hidden by um, a simple workflow. As long as it's solving a problem that we said we want to solve, that's that's the piece that I'm trying to say. Is let, let's make sure that we've identified the problems we want to solve, and then we can figure out how do we solve them. Okay. A, a bit of that on the requirements is still on me. I, I know I owe you at least one or two PRs there for the requirements doc. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'll that, find oh, out what the video is first, from okay. Wednesday and get that posted, because I guess you guys had a meeting and didn't get posted yet, so I'll find that. I think there were a couple. Mine was earlier, and then there was probably one from a week or two ago that I wasn't in. In the requirements repo? Yeah. Can... Just that Steve was talking about buying the Wednesday meetings. Yeah. Yeah, just ping me. Sorry, just did a quick detour so we can catch up with the conversations. Just ping me any dates that things got recorded um, and or that you had meetings yeah. that sh there should be recorded because they are auto recorded. And I'll ping Amy and get them posted. So those are the, the two Wednesday ones, Marina. Yeah. OK, yeah. Um, question a little bit roundabout, but getting back to this, um, to you, Steve. The notary implementation of the registry, does that include a lot of the artifact stuff that we've been discussing? And where does that stand? Uh, well, I don't want to circumvent. Did, did, Marina, were you good with what you wanted to cover? This is going to circle I, back, Marina. I think so. so. I okay. Guess. All right. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. So, um, 
what we've been trying to do is um, kind of a learning from what we did with Notary V1 and even some stuff we did with Helm and other art specific artifacts types is rather than try to make a specific technology work in registries, we keep on shooting for generic storage of artifacts. And um, what we found is we were able to just make individual artifacts, you know, standalone, be able to push to a registry pretty straightforward by just using that config media type. As we got into the notary and SBOM ones, we realized that in order to maintain um, the immutability of the digest and the tag, you know, the manifest, they get push, pushed in to begin with, and the ability to add another signature. And this was driven from requirements, right? So the we said that was a requirement. We can't change the tag. We can't change the digest or the content of it. So that forced us to deal with some different design patterns. The design patterns say I can add something to a registry and link it to existing content. And I could add lots of additional things and link it to the same content without ever merging, having to update an existing manifest. So when, that's why we're not using index, for instance. Um, that generic approach has turned out to have a lot of universal support, not just for notary and SBOM. There's a bunch of other um, com confidential computing work that teams are doing that want to leverage that as well. So I would say that what we're trying to do is continue down this approach that we're coming up with a generalization and registries that will support these scenarios. So if there's something new that we haven't, that we don't yet support for, you know, if there's a requirement here that, you know, Tuff has an, an answer and requires another attribute or something, whatever it is, a change to the basics of registry storage, then we can incorporate that. So does that answer your question or is that too much detail? Um, not enough detail, actually. So on specifically, it's like the notary v2 slash registry repo. We got a image out there for notary or mv2 prototype one tag. That's part of your prototype that you, you're working oh, on. Oh, yeah. So, so if you notes. go through those, the demo steps yeah. that I put there, um, basically, it's a built version of the distribution. I forgot exactly how it, I put a couple of out there. I put out a web at networks. I put out a distribution under notary. I put out a couple of things to make it yeah. easy so people don't have to build themselves. So, but the idea is that is a prototype of what would be um, uh, in distribution or in, in, you know, in a registry. So does that registry include the artifact query APIs to be able to query and say which artifacts Not are yet. there that point to this one? It's, uh, if you look at the label, it actually says prototype one. So Avaral did a, a really rough hack just to make like an under the covers thing, just to prove we can do the experience. And there'll be a prototype too that actually has that manifest links API on it. Okay, so not there yet, that, but I'm not guessing the rough hack is just hacking tags or something. Uh, no, it actually has a, there is a separate API. There's a links, um, there's a, a third links API that he, you have to get called the NV2 client currently calls it. Okay. Um, so that we don't pollute. Cause again, we were shooting for the experience. We didn't want tags to get polluted. Yeah. Uh, he has a, a prototype of it, but we realized there's a piece missing in the payload. So in the next week or two, we'll get that, uh, we'll get that posted. Yeah. Cause circling back to Marina's proposal is I was trying to think of how we can take a lot of the stuff that she's working on her side with a registry that has some of the artifact stuff with the query APIs and things like that and try to actually throw some of this together that might implement some of these API calls and make it look a little bit more something that people can understand and play with. Uh, I'll, we, we should be able to prioritize that this week. Um, we do our internal meeting on Tuesday evenings. So let me check in tomorrow night and see if we can turn that around and hopefully demo it by next, two, by next Monday. That'd be awesome. Yeah, that'd be okay, really cool. So back to what you guys were trying to do. Yeah, so um, so that that is kind of like yeah, that is really the next piece is is making this work on with via registry API calls to show the actual workflows, because um, I think there's a couple of documents that I've um, I think they're in PRs right now that um, kind of walk through the workflow, but I think it's better for everyone to see it, you know, in code and in demo format. So um, that would be a, that would be a great next step here. And as far as the requirements, I'd I'd happily write write up another thing describing how tough addresses some of the requirements, but I feel like we have gone over that a number of times. 
I think we've gone over it. I don't think we have good consensus that the the answer solves a problem that we're prioritizing. And that's the point. Well, that it's a problem that's sure. listed in our requirements docs. So, but I'll, I can call that out again. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, because I don't think that the um, the just signature design addresses, um, you know, it doesn't address revocation, it doesn't address um, key distribution, it doesn't address um, time stamping and some of the other things that you really would need kind of for any solution that uses, um, yeah, keys. Yeah, totally agree on the revocation. Um, distribution, I, I'm not sure. Like that's yes, th those are the pieces. The time stamping, as long as a key expires, you know, I think that's the the question. Well, I think well for view location to work, you need time stamping because unless you're only using key expiration times for time stamping, um, either a view location list or kind of the tough style listing trusted keys, both of those solutions you need to know you have the most up to date version of them. So in either case, you would need some kind of time stamp that verifies that that situation. Yeah, part that I'm trying to keep in scope as we're working on a lot of this stuff is I feel like the tough might lag some of the other work that we've been working on with the Notary V2. And so mentally I'm trying to keep track of what pieces we need to make the MV2 prototype work at all and what things can be added on later and where the value adds are in those add on pieces. So that's part of what I'm trying to keep in mind on my side of this is how we can structure this like a multi-stage process. And maybe not every user wants to have the full time stamping stuff going on. They don't want to run a separate server. They just want some basic signing and deal with some of the issues they know they're going to have by doing it that way. Yeah, I think that's that's totally valid. I just really think that if 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 people need the full security, I think there really needs to be an option that's built in to this system. And I do think creating options is really important. And I'm trying to build those in. Here, yep, agreed. Yeah, I, I'll pieces. hesitate on the options one. I just like there should be a standard that we're trying to ship, and if it's if it's optional, why is it optional? Like it, we should be able to find the right balance. Um, but I think that if, the right the right balance for an organization with two people is very different than the right balance for an organization with five hundred people with millions of people using their software. I just don't think that those could ever have the exact same. So like, you know, they, it could be within the same format, within the same spec, but they might you do slightly different things with their key management because they can't, they can't host other servers and other things that you would need for the full effect of the security. Well, yeah, that's I think kind of what we're saying is as cloud providers and vendors, right? It's not just cloud providers that they could provide those services and including here's software you could run yourselves. So, right, because what we're trying to do is the company of thousands of people you know, the Microsofts, the NVIDIAs, and I'm, I'm trying to pick some software companies for, for an example, you need to be able to make their software available in a secure way that the companies that have two people that are running on AWS or Google or Azure can easily consume or even on-prem. So that's that's what the about, real balance that we're trying to What about for. the smaller companies that are producing the software? Because like service well, I think, is free. Sorry, if I might jump in. I think one of the things here that's important to keep in mind is defining where the interfaces are. Um, and so technically, like you should be able to use any sort of key management as long as the signatures and the revocation data or uh, allow list data is flowing through, right? So it's really just defining where the interfaces, um, if someone wants to do key management their own way, uh, what information would they need to plug into the system? Um, and I think that's, that's how we would go about doing that. Uh, which is why I think some of the uh, requirement stocks that we still have left to flush out, like those should capture uh, what those interfaces look like. Um, I don't think we want to be uh, prescriptive in how keys get managed to that detail. Um, you know, a lot of companies are going to have single sign-on, they're going to have uh, identity management pieces in place. Um, some are going to want to use things like tough. Uh, and so it's going to be a mix and match, but we just want to make sure that there is a standard on how that information uh, gets propagated to uh, customers. So you're really just don't really care how companies manage their keys. Uh, you're still getting the information that you need. And kind of add on to that, you know, probably come as a little bit of blasphemy as Steve, but not everybody that I work with is in the cloud. 
Um, so I do have some of these things. It'll be like an IoT device out in a field somewhere that doesn't have a consistent connection to the network. And so they're going to have a different requirement in terms of how much they want to allow these keys to drift or potentially expire, something like that. And so they're going to have different requirements of whether they even care about having that snapshot versus somebody that's working directly in the cloud and just wants to know, hey, these snapshots need to be continuously regularly updated by some server that's doing that for us. We're willing to run that. That's, I think there are different use cases out there. I, I don't think we're saying something so different. Like the, the, to where the, how the keys are managed, like we've always said that that should be pluggable however they want to use it. We've said we wanted to support um, offline, you know, offline air gapped environments, including IoT is extremely important because if anything, the IoT devices are even more important because they're literally roaming around the field on public internets in many cases. So um, we absolutely have to have a solution for that. So I, I think where, where I'm pushing harder on is if I acquire some software from a large company and I wanna consume it from a small company, the small company shouldn't have to implement something monstrous just to be able to consume that software securely, including an IoT device, right? It could be a small company of two people, or it could be a device which has got a very minimal footprint of memory and CPU that can run on some farm tractor. So we need to make sure that the solutions scale um, and that there's not the typical Windows options of death, that there's so many choices that I can't figure out how to use the thing. Um, but you know, how somebody manages their private keys, completely up to them. Yeah, I think that's kind of what I meant by options, like it, more options of where you host things, options of how it's centralized versus options of um, of APIs, because those I think need to be somewhat consistent for, for things to work together, because if you have 100 APIs, a user can never download two pieces of software. Um. Right, right. And if we need to add, look, I've never been against having to run add new APIs or add new functionality, right? We've continued. It's just it's just code. We can make it do whatever we want. But there's humans involved you have to figure out how can they use this thing including how can they write code against it so if we need another timestamp server for instance as i'm just hearing words put up and there's a really justified requirement for it we'll absolutely you know figure out how to make that work um i'm not trying to push back on that i'm just trying to figure that's why i keep on pushing like, what is the requirement driving the pain and how do we make the pain minimally pain minimally painful to support the usability and security confidence that somebody has yeah, my fear is honestly less about the difficulty of running some of these servers, like a timestamp server that's constantly updating that. In terms of complexity for a small organization, it's honestly, it's the reverse case. It is thinking of the Docker hubs out there that have millions and millions of images. And if they need to update a timestamp on every one of those images every hour, that's a lot of overhead on them that doesn't properly scale nicely with the CDN and some of these other challenges they might have. And so my fear is honestly coming from the flip side of this. Yeah, I think um, on the Tough team, we've actually discussed that particular case a lot because Docker, I think, is bigger than, you know, there's just a lot of images. So something like a snapshot um, starts to become a little less scalable once you get into millions of, of images. I think that's where a couple of ideas, either having it the, the Tough rooted at the organization level um, comes up, or we have some kind of like snapshot Merkle trees and other kind of space saving time stamping methods um, that could be used to kind of sign this one central thing that then has um, cryptographically aligned to all of the other pieces of it. Um, which I think sounds more complicated than it is, but basically it's trying to to lower the amount of metadata that individual users have to deal with for something as big as Docker. Yeah, I mean, again, just not to be a broker, let's just figure out the, what the requirement is because one of the things we were in one of those prototypes in scale, we were assuming that we could actually bring even, an, um, it's not quite anonymized, but aggregated data across multiple repos to create a, a timestamp that spanned what I call the Coke and Pepsi scenario, which from a trust level, like we can't do that. We can't get access to two customers data and do any kind of aggregation because a lot of our contracts say we can't even acknowledge that customer exists. So we need to make sure that that secure boundary is within a customer's scope. Um, but again, it just kind of goes back what which particular problem are we solving and then I'm sure there's a dozen different designs, but we'll know that the designs meet the specific um, uh, requirements that we have. 
So maybe that's the place that like I, there's some PRs out there that we we including me haven't had the chance to kind of finish reviewing and get merged. Let's maybe focus on getting that stuff down because that's really helped a lot. I mean, early on, for those of you who've been with us for over a year now, we went a, a lot or, uh, around a lot of things related to using index or other things, a bunch of different designs. But we've went back and just nailed that we cannot change the manifest. We cannot change the digest. People need to be able to do deployments on that. And that helped guide designs that actually evolved and created new APIs and new implementations because we had to meet that requirement. So we just nail what problem we're solving. Then I think we'll find the designs will fall out. And if we have to build monstrous you know, things that are easy to run, whatever that means, um, we'll design it, write the code, and people can just run it. That's the beauty of being able to download software and running it on-prem completely. Like, there's no dependency on a cloud. There should be no dependency on a cloud to run this stuff. If somebody wants to run it completely on-prem with their own IoT, there should be no problem in doing that. Okay. Um, John, ever IoT, what is it? Internet of Things? I'm not sure what the, the question is there, but. So Internet of Things, right? Small devices, am I missing? Okay. You, you just said with their own IoT. Is that, I might have just drifted off and missed a conversation about Internet of Things. Yeah. In other words, if somebody, uh, Brandon was making a point that I, I that I just wanted to make sure I was balancing, that if somebody wants to run some IoT hardware, that they should they should be able to do that, and they shouldn't have to depend on a cloud, right? Like there's there's certainly customers that are doing that, and we want to make sure that this this environment works for them as well. The solution that we're providing should not be dependent on a big cloud being able to run this monstrous infrastructure or because it's too big for any two person company to run themselves, not just that they could use a cloud, but they could run themselves. So that's that's kind of just the scope of what I'm trying to say. Like this is not a big company solution. This is a solution that should scale from big companies so that small companies can consume it and small companies can run all uh, on their own. Okay. What else do we have? I, I did hear that um, the prototyping that we've been doing, uh, more people want to be able to, pro to party on that. And that's why I did um, complete the demo steps so they are runnable by somebody else. And I'd love for others to go through that. Um, please don't pick apart the code that implements it. It is totally, um, you know, what is it? Cable ties and bailing wire and gum and so forth. It, we were shooting for is the experience possible and can we completely hack it and make it work? Now that we know and we like the experience and we, we know it can work, we're now going back and iterating um, on the actual code implementation. Um, there was some comments around the, we're just using Docker save for instance, like, yeah, it was just because it worked. Um, now that we know that works, and, and this is why, to be quite honest, some of the devs were not willing to actually make their PRs on the public because they didn't want to be criticized for the code. It's like, it's okay, we're just, let's shoot for the experiences. If we like the experiences, we can go back and change the code to be the most proper factored clean design uh, that we have. So prototype one was definitely a hack to, to prove it works for the links. Uh, prototype two will have the, um, the artifact links API that we've been talking basically is a, a manifests, basically as a manifest, you give it the digest and then there's a links API, if I remember right and hangs off the extension model we've been uh, doing in distribution spec. So we'll have that within the next week and that should enable people to start putting other things. I've been trying to support Nisha in her uh, SBOM work as well so they can start doing that. And we have some changes coming to ORAS as well so you can not just push individual artifacts like we do with ORAS today, but you'll be able to push something with ORAS that says, by the way, this links to um, something that's already in the registry. So we wanna get those out so people can start doing more experiments. Any other questions, thoughts? Okay, 
Um, so just on the videos, I'll follow up with Amy. If there's other videos that you guys are recording, just, just ping me or ping Amy. You don't have to block on me. Uh, and she'll get those posted to um, what she does is she posts them to the YouTube channel because you have to kind of grab them and post them. Uh, and then I and anybody could do it. You know, once they're on the YouTube channel, you can go back to the hack doc that I just put, you know, recorded video uh, under the date so people can find it. So I'm trying to what, people shouldn't have to go to YouTube to find it. I want to try to make our hack doc be the index of information. Um, so if you guys are hosting a meeting, don't block on me. If you don't want to ping her directly, say, hey, we just finished this meeting. Can you post that? Let me know when it's posted. And then you can go back to the hack doc and add that uh, to your notes as well. Uh, so with that, if nobody's got anything else, we'll pick up next week. Thanks, folks. Thanks. Bye.